And then he was so excited, he was so very, very excited. And then he said, uh, Ram has already instructed, Lord Ram has already instructed all the demigods. We should all go and become like monkeys. And then uh, he said, I'm also planning to go. So Shiva said, I'm also planning to go and become a monkey. And I will help in Ram in destroying Dravana because the atrocities of Dravana has gone really to the high scale. And Sati got really confused. She said, why would you want to kill Ram? Because I see you as a well-wisher of Ravana. You have been giving so many boons to Ravana. Now why would you go ahead and kill Ravana as one of your expansions? So then Lord Shiva replied that, you know, Ravana was able to please my 10 expansions or Rudras, but he has actually dissatisfied and angered my 11th expansion. So I will go as my expansion and join the army of the monkey clan and be Hanuman. So that's how, you know, he came uh, Hanuman. Of course, Hanuman uh, was the, uh, you know, he was the son, the, the whole conception was carried by the Vayudev, so he's the son of the Vayudev, as we call him, uh, Kesari and Anjana, uh, you know, like. And so there's a very beautiful pastimes of even Hanuman, of how Hanuman, we're going a little uh, towards Hanuman, but I think, okay, remind me, we can come to the Hanuman chapter of how Hanuman actually used his anger because I always feel it's very interesting to talk about uh, the, something from Ramayana and something, of course we're talking about the Bhagavatam. So here we're talking about we cannot control the forces of anger, therefore when we look at the material things, we cannot avoid feeling attraction or repulsion for them. What are the causes of anger? Anyone? Yes, lust. Lust, okay. Which shloka says lust? Uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it's in the first chapter where... Uh, first chapter. First chapter. When when uh, Krishna says contemplation. So you see, of yes, contemplation of this, yes, that's there. So when, if you ask somebody from outside, if you say, you know, there are so many anger management courses happening, do you know that? Yeah. There's so many anger management courses happening, and if you ask them uh, how to control anger, they'll have their own solutions, which do not work, <laughs> which practically do not work. But if somebody tells you, <coughs> the first and foremost important thing is to realize what is the root cause of anger. Why does a person get angry? Is it natural? Unsatisfied desires. Unsatisfied desires, that's true. What else? Mm, expectations that are not fulfilled. That's very true. Expectations that are not fulfilled. Desires. Desires. We said unfulfilled desires, yes. Expectations, what else? Envy. Some people are perfectionists, so they want to see something just for their Yes, life. perfectionists. They are very perfectionists. How can this not happen? Yeah. I am the one who is supposed to do it. Right? And I can bring perfection if I work, and if I'm not able to bring perfection to my work, I get angry. Okay, what else? Bodily attachments and you end up feeling to certain people. Yes, that's true. That's going on at a higher level and saying, okay, bodily attachments and not able to surrender. So one thing is for sure, you know, there's a shloka in Bhagavad Gita which is 2.62, which says Sandhya Sanjayate Kama, Kama Kroda Vijayate. Right? We know about 2.62. Can you pull up 2.62 in uh, Bhagavad Gita? The shloka, I, I mean, I know the shloka, but we'll read the translation once, 2.62. So this is the first principle, or the first cause of the anger is that we think that we are the enjoyer. I am the enjoyer, and we also think this way, not just the enjoyer, I think that I am the enjoyer, and I want to satisfy all my desires. Like you said, unfulfilled desires. But the unfulfilled would happen only if you have desires, right? So the first is that I am a supreme enjoyer, and I want to definitely, you know, enjoy all the desires that I have. I can think about anything and I can enjoy about anything. So it's 2.62, which talks about the same thing. Dhyaka Vishya Punsaya, Sangat Sate Pujayate, Pujayate, Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha, Kama Kodavi Jayate. Which means, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And from such attachment, lust develops, and from lust, anger arises. Yeah? It's a science which has been explained in Bhagavad Gita by Krishna. He says, you contemplate on the objects of senses, after you contemplate on the objects, then of course a person develops attachment to them. What is contemplation? Thinking think about it. Yeah, thinking deeply, you, you're too much thinking about it, I need a Versace watch. And you keep thinking about it, you keep thinking about it, then you develop attachment towards it. Let me go to the Versace store, oh no, 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 maybe not Versace, not Stones carry it, or Hudson Bay carry it, I'll go to the Hudson Bay. And then after getting the attachment, 
then what happens is that you know there's lust. So lust for having that object. Lust is not just a bodily lust in terms of uh, the sexual attraction, but lust is also you know similar lust. And from lust, the anger arises. If I'm not able to get it, then I'll be angry. Or if I have it and it gets you know if it needs a repair, then I'll be angry. So just a simple example. Do you want to read this uh, quickly, anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, while contemplating the object of senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops, and from lust, anger arises. Yeah, purpose. One who is in a Christian conscious is subjected to material desires while contemplating the objects of the senses. The senses require real enrichment, and if they are not engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, they will certainly seek enrichment in the service of materialism. In the material world, everyone, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, to say nothing of other demigods in the heavenly planet, is subjected to the influence of sense objects, and the only method to get out of this puzzle of material existence is to become Krishna conscious. Anyone else? Yeah. Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva was deep in meditation, but when Parvati agitated him for sense pleasure, he agreed to the proposal, and as a result, Kartike was born. When Haridas Thakur was a young devotee of the Lord, he was simply allured by the incarnation of Maya Devi, but Haridas easily passed the test because of his unalloyed devotion to Lord Krishna. As illustrated in the above mentioned verse of Sri Yamuna Charya, a sincere devotee of the Lord shuns all material sense enjoyment due to his higher taste for spiritual enjoyment in association of the Lord. That is the secret of success. One who is not Therefore, in Krishna consciousness, however powerful he may be in controlling the senses by artificial repression, is surely ultimately is sure ultimately to fail. For the slightest thought of sense pleasure will agitate him to gratify his desires. Yeah, what beautiful, right? Prabhupada writes so beautiful purpose. Every time I have any issues, you know, you can always get back to Bhagavad Gita, chapter two, chapter three, read about these things, how beautifully this is explained. So this shloka just not, just not talks about the anger management, but also talks about the secret of success. Prabhupada is writing, that is the secret of success. These purpose, we should be, you know, we should try and memorize these purpose as much as possible, not just the translation and the shloka, because they help us. They, when, you know, whenever you know, we are in a situation when we feel I'm actually falling down or I need some help, these purpose are our rescue. So he talks about, uh, you know, this is the secret of success. And only if devotee is the one who can somehow manage to go ahead and control the anger or manage the anger better. Nobody else outside any artificial repression. So this is the first reason of anger, the first root cause of anger, that we think that we are the enjoyer. I cannot be enjoyer, and I want to satisfy all my desires. What else? Is there any other root cause? Like she was mentioning, we feel, we tend to be perfectionist, which is a shloka in Bhagavad Gita where we think this way. This is Shloka in Bhagavad Gita. It's, it doesn't say that we are the perfections, but it says that I am the doer. That's also one. Uh, and uh, which says that I, you know, a person by the influence of the uh, by the influence of the false ego thinks himself to be the doer. But actually, it's the modes of material nature that are in the after yeah. Which shloka is this? Uh, I think this is 3. Point, uh, this is only for a chapter, 3.26 or something. Can we, can we open 3. that? 3.24. Can we open that? I'm not sure. 3.24. Yeah, we'll read this shloka. Well. Yeah, yeah, soul bewildered by the influence of false ego thinks himself the doer of activities and that are actually act and that are in actuality carried out by the three modes of material nature purpose anyone yeah sure two persons one in krishna consciousness and another in material consciousness 
working on the same level may appear to be working on the same platform, but there is a wide gulf of difference in their respective positions. A person in material consciousness is convinced by Paul's ego that he is the doer of everything. He does not know that a mechanism of body is produced by material nature, which works under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. Yes. The materialistic person has no knowledge that ultimately is under the control of Krishna. The person in false ego takes all credit for doing everything independently and that is the symptom of his nuisance. He does not know that this gross and subtle body is the creation of material nature under the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and as such, as, as such his bodily and mental activities should be engaged in the service of Krishna in Krishna Consciousness. Okay. The ignorant man forgets that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is known as the Hishikesha, as the master of senses of the material body. For due to his long misuse of the senses and sense gratification, he is factually bewildered by the false ego, which makes him forget his eternal relationship with Krishna. Yeah, thank you. So first, the first cause is that we think that I am being joy and I want to satisfy all my desires. And okay, now I have desires, I have, I'm the enjoyer, now let me do that because I'm the doer. I am the doer and I will be able to satisfy all my desires. Tell me, what does it need to satisfy my desire? But then what happens? Are we able to desire? Are we able to you know, gratify all our desires? No, it leads to unfulfilled desires. It leads to unsatisfied desires and that leads to frustration and anger. So, uh, which is again a shloka in Bhagavad Gita, the one that we were initially trying to say, which is Kaam Esh Kro Esh Rajagun Sabudma. So, uh, this is one of the shlokas which says that, uh, which, which talks about the same thing. I think you can read this one as well. These three are very important. I keep going back to them again and again. They're in different chapters, and these are actually the true ways to control the anger, the true ways to understand our desires. Whenever we feel that we are actually you know, being kicked down, we should actually rescue to the Bhagavad I say that again and again because I have done it and I, I keep trying it. I'm not the expert for sure. I'm in the process of purifying myself. Uh, so, but you know, these shlokas really help, like I was saying. So this particular shloka, Kam Ish Kro Vesh But if you read it from the sequence, you will feel, wow, Bhagavad Gita is such a beautiful science. First he talks about what is lust, how everything, you know, how I develop lust. And then later it talks about the solution as well. So you know the science behind okay, what is happening and how can I control it. So if you have any problem which is related to any kind of lust, you read these shlokas, that helps you. Anyone wants to read this one? Kamesh, Pradesh, This is, uh, is it 3837? Yes, 3.37. So if you read 3.37, which is Kan Yoga, so Arjuna is the one that is asking a question to Krishna and then Krishna replies with it. So this is the reply by Krishna. You all read Bhagavad Gita, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, but, but read third, fourth, second, third, yes, fourth yes. chapter? Yes. Okay, very good. So the Supreme Personality of God had said, it is lust only Arjuna, which is born of contact with material modes of passion and later transformed into what? What is anger? And which is all devouring, sinful enemy of this world. Are we there? Okay. Does someone want to quickly read it? Yeah. Right. 
method of living and acting. Yeah. So what does that? We've seen that you know people get more into more of goodness. That's been observed, and that's why people say, what's the importance of morning program? This is the importance of morning program. It helps you stay in the mode of goodness, and until one is in the mode of goodness and subtle good, and then you know moving on, it is not possible to elevate in Krishna consciousness because mode of ignorance and mode of passion. I came in the morning and one devotee told me, "Babu, I am mode of ignorance personified." <laughs> everyone, everyone has the mixture of all the three: ignorance, passion, and goodness. You should try and try uh, to have more of goodness. Yeah. <coughs> uh, we'll quickly read the. Okay, it's a big one. I think you can read it at your own time and your own pace because we are, you know. So these are the proper reasons one should understand that I'm. You know, these shlokas are. One should always think about these shlokas, contemplate about these shlokas. That I'm the supreme enjoyer. How I want to satisfy my desire. Then I feel that yes, I would be able to do it. I'm the doer. Perhaps by getting a great job. Perhaps by you know getting the best girl in the world, the best boy in the world, or whatever reason, I'll be I'm the doer. And then unsatisfied desire leads to frustration and anger. So you know there were these two. There's a story of two asuras. You know there's an asura called uh, Nikumba. You know Nikumba. Mm -hmm. So there's an asura called Nikumba. Who has heard of Nikumba? Show me Nikumba. Yeah, so who was Nikumba? He came in the lineage of uh, which big demon that we all know? Hiranyakashipu. And Nikumba had two sons. What are the names of the two sons? So, okay, Nikumba had two sons, Sun and Upasun. He had two sons, Sun and Upasun, and both of them were inseparable. When I say inseparable, which means that they were the ones who would, you know, eat together, you know, they would sleep on the same bed, they would share all the things, so all their pains and pleasure were equally shared. And everyone said they're absolutely inseparable. And because they came in the lineage of the demons, so they decided that let's please Brahma. And what happens when the demons please Brahma? Mm -hmm. Boom. Mm -hmm. They get the task They get, okay, you know, you get a blessing, you get a boon. So they get a boon, they ask, they said, please bless us that nobody can kill us and we become immortal. And then what did Brahma say? Not possible. Not possible. Is Brahma immortal? No. no. No, so he said, unfortunately not possible, but Brahma is very intelligent. He's the creator of the universe, right? Creator of the world. So he says, yes, nobody will be able to kill you other than you yourself. And then I said, yeah, we are both inseparable. We are like the bros, right? We are the best people that we know in the world. We share everything. We are never going to kill each other. And then, of course, like all the other demons, they went on and you know they uh, they conquered the heavens and Indra and other you know other demigods. They got perturbed by this thing, and then they said, okay, let's do one thing. Let's go to Brahma and ask for the solution. So Brahma said, they, he cannot be killed by anyone, but they can be killed only by themselves. So they sent an Apsara, and the Apsara name was Tilakma, something like Tilakma. So Apsara came, and then they were, of course, attracted to the Apsara, and then both of them fought, and they killed each other. So that's also one story how, you know, people, when they're frustrated, they're angry, they, they, you know, they kill each other. But there, there are definitely solutions for the anger that one can work on. We read so many solutions in these three shlokas that we read in the Bhagavad Gita. But other than that, you know, one can remember that you know there are body level solutions. What do you do on a body level to uh, take care of your anger? First, inhale the right nostril. Deep breathing. Deep breathing is one thing that we do. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Deep breathing. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's on a that's on a higher level. On a body level, you get up in the morning, you take bath, you know, you do all those things, you take deep breath, breathing exercises. Some people walk, you know, they you know they they're walking, they feel the physical exertion. So that's on a, on a body level. On a mental level, uh, it's important to understand one shloka again in Bhagavad Gita, which says that mind is the best friend of the human being, and mind is also the worst enemy. So once you understand about these things, that how mind works, then you are not wanting to get attracted to them. And the third would be more on an intellectual level. So you know how it works, right? Body, mind, intellectual, and spiritual level. We all know about these four levels. So on the all four levels, we can do it. Most of the times, if you go outside and you ask about anger and emotions, they are confined to the body level. They say either you do pranayamas, or they will, you know, talk about something on a mental level. They will give you some great one-liners and great, you know, that this this and this person quoted this. So that helps you give you kind of a mental to know, okay, maybe I can, you know, control anger this way. And then the third, as I said, is an intellectual level. So what is an intellectual level? And right knowledge, right thought. Right thought. And contemplation is very important. But when we contemplate, so that's also about, uh, you know, when we contemplate on something, that is something that makes it uh, more intellectual because the intelligence is able to control the mind. So many times, 
you know, there is a there's a mnemonic that one should try and follow, which is AMC. In AM, do C. You were able to guess it. What is AM? Anger management, early morning chanting. AM is early morning. AM and C is chanting. So chanting is one thing, but AM is also AMC. That how you, I see it is also Adhyan, Manan, and Chintan. These are three Sanskrit words. Adhyan is what? Reading. Reading. Adhyan is study. Reading. What is Manan? Memorizing. Remember. Yeah, remember. Manan is remembering or memorizing. Like few shlokas, you memorize. You memorize the morning prayers. You memorize other bhajans. That's memorizing. So every day in the morning, you have already, you know, you've already done the two steps. You study few things, read few things, right? You're doing the adhyan. You are memor You've already memorized a few shlokas. You've already memorized the morning prayers. So you do manan. But are we doing chintan as well? See, it's chintan. Chintan means reflection. Chintan means deep thinking. Like, do we actually sit down sometime and think, okay, I read this Shishtashtakam Shloka, which says, Pranadapi Surijena, Tarunapi Surishona, Amanina Mandir, Gitanya Hari, or I just read it and then forget. Do we actually contemplate? What's the purpose? Because sometimes San Sanskrit is not the first language for most of us. And then we don't even understand what they say. So are we able to be in that moment and contemplate of what we are saying? Even if we just do the morning prayers, I've always heard this, if we just do the morning prayers, with a full attention, when we do the morning prayers, with our full heart in it, and we contemplate on each and every word, you, you've seen that difference, haven't you? Like, you can read the whole Guru Ashtakam and go away, and then you say, Jai Prabhupada, Jai Prabhupada, and it becomes a kind of a ritual. But if you contemplate on each and every word that we say, if you contemplate on the Tulsi Aarti that we say, like even for Tulsi Aarti, when we, you know, uh, it's so some of the artists that everyone's we have your own favorites that you know I I, can, I relate most to it and I relate most to it. I, I think I was speaking once about Tulsi Arti that I, I love it so much. Right? It talks about that you know I the only desire that I have is that give me the vast and the love. Mm -hmm. And if you contemplate on that, most of the time when people come to the foreign nation, the only desire they have is give me the permanent residency of that country. <laughs> <laughs> Once you have the permanent residency, then give me the citizenship. And once you have the citizenship, then give me the best job. And once you have the best job, then give me the big house. And then the bigger house. And then it goes on and on and on. <laughs> but how in Tulsi Arti, we say, Mora Ehi Abhilas, Bilas Kunjali Ovas. Right? So if, even if we, every day we contemplate, you can be anywhere in the whole world and still be in the love and consciousness. For that, contemplation is so important. Uh, everyone has their own points of contemplation. So Adhyan, Manan, and Chintan. Never forget to have Chintan. Chintan can happen when you sit for a moment, think deeply, think pensively about it. And then um, it could be discussion with the devotees. Uh, I, I tell you, I just, uh, I think a week ago or something, uh, one of my friends gave me a call from India. He's a devotee. He's a temple president of one of the temples in North, America, in North India. And then he mentioned, he said, the first thing he asked me, he said, okay, Prabhu, so what are you reading? And I, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm reading this. And because I knew the next question would be, you know, I read this, and this is what I did, this was the line, and then we start sharing. And this is such a beautiful feeling. If you meet the devotees, you ask them, you tell them that, you know, what are you reading? And then they say, oh, I'm reading this, or, you know, mother, I'm reading this, and whatever, this is happening. And then you share yours, and they share their feelings, and then you contemplate much about it. Every time I see this particular, you know, uh, this is, this is Adhyan. We saw this kind of painting, and every time I see this, I feel thankful to uh, Kunti. Kunti was the one who made it? Yeah. She, she, yeah, painted. It. she painted it. Yeah, so she painted it. And uh, um, so th and then you, you rememberize the shloka. What is the shloka? That this, you know, this going from one body to the other. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 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 they uh, they So that's about manan, that's about you remembering. And then it's contemplating. Like this beautiful exercise, whenever you do this beautiful exercise, and I, I do it, and I know many other people also do it, and the devotees do it. So if you do a simple exercise of contemplating, okay, I can actually remember the days when I was in high school. I can even remember the days when I was in my class fifth, grade fifth, or whatever, right? You remember that. But you see, were you in the same body as you are right now? No, that's not the different, that was a different body. 
And then you remember yourself when you grew up, you were in a high school, then you went to college, it was a different body, and now you're in a different body, and at the time of the death, you will change this body. So the moment you know you're going to change this body, then you won't be obsessed with the new Korean skincare. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you and then the body keeps changing, Hare Krishna. And when the body, you know, you know, and then you, everything, and then I, when you realize, when you go back to that body, you say, Oh my God, my body needs at that point of time was so different. Now it is so different. And then, but you have to know the marketeers in the world, they realize that, that you know that your body needs are changing. So from skincare, first they'll tell you, you know, you should use neem to clear off your pimples. Then, I'm sorry, I'm giving the example of uh, the most gross, the most, uh, you know, body conception. Then they know oh, you've grown up. Now you should be using, uh, in your skincare, you should be using vitamin C, brightening. That is the age. Then they say, oh, no, but this person is going old. Now you should be using retinols and whatever, anti-aging, wrinkle creams. So marketers realize that they are understanding that their body is changing. But what market is and what the world also don't realize is that at one day this body is going to finish. And there is a life after that as well. So the more one contemplates on these things, the more you talk to devotees, the more it feels more in great. Every time when I see this, I remember my grandmother. And you know the concept of the soul is so, so very imbibed to my heart that uh, when my grandmother was about to leave her body, just five minutes before that, and I say this and, um, a couple of times, and I've said this before as well, uh, because, you know, this gives me kind of good realization. When she was about to leave her body, you know, 10, 15 minutes prior to that, she told all her grandsons and she told, you know, the relatives around, can you please go out? It's my time to leave. She said, it's my time to leave. And then she was all fine. She, there was no problem. She said, it's my time to leave. Can you give me the picture of my Guru Maharaj? Can you give me the picture of, you know, of my deities? And can you give me Tulsi? And can you give me Ganga water? And the Gandhi, you know, since we're reading about this then of the Viva Gandhi, we're just talking about that. She asked for that, she sat in the position, and then she left her body. So, and the way she left her body, that always gives me that feeling that actually, we are not, you know, perhaps she saw the Vishnu roots, or if not, she saw some young roots. We don't know, but she saw someone, and she realized that this is the time to go away. So, you know, that, that makes me realize that, hey, if you're not this body, at the time of death, you know, as we read in the scriptures, certain things happen. So, so that's a kind of a contemplation uh, one can definitely do. Uh, uh, what I think, uh, this is what I was wanted to say. I did mention that uh, there is a story of uh, another story that I wrote and I read yesterday. If, uh, okay, you, okay, I think, uh, how much time do you have? Is it 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Ten minutes is enough time. So we were talking about Hanuman in the beginning, who's an expansion, who's an eleventh expansion of Krishna. And you all said Hanuman used his anger for what? Krishna. In the service of Lord Ram. In the service of Lord Ram. But was Hanuman always like that? No. 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 Do you remember that Hanuman? Uh, so one of the pastimes of Hanuman is, if you read Hanuman Chavisa, you like this book called the Chronicles of Hanuman, which is written by Shubhulas Prabhu, not our Shubhulas Prabhu, but uh, the other devotee Shubhulas Prabhu. So he's written this book. And he has a lot of pastimes written about Hanuman there. So one of the pastimes, the beautiful pastimes, is that when Hanuman was young, uh, he, you know, he saw the sun. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, he saw the sun. What did he do? He thought he ate mango, mango and went to eat it. He was a red fruit. And then what did he do? He ate it. He flew towards it to eat it. He flew towards it and he ate it. And then what happened? Indra. He got cursed. Cursed. What was the curse? He'll forget his powers unless they are for a cause or something like that. Yeah, so, so that was one thing. So when he went up, so you know, it was the biggest conference, you know, like we have in the world these days, the biggest conference of the year. Every second month, every second day, they have the biggest conference of the year. So the Indra was having the biggest conference of the millennium or for whatever, yoga, and he said, it's the biggest conference, and immediately they observed, they said, oh my God, there's no power, there's power cut. What's happening? Is it a power cut? We are in the heavens, the sun is always there for us, why is there a power cut? So then they realized that there was a monkey boy who came and who ate sun. Even Rahu came and stopped him and he said, no, 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 you know, I'm the one who, you know, swallows the sun for a while or whatever. So he swallowed uh, Rahu as well. So he swallowed the sun and he swallowed, uh, you know, uh, Rahu. And then at that point of time, Indra became really angry. He became really, you know, furious. He said, who could do that? 
that. So he releases Thunderbolt, and the Thunderbolt went and hit the monkey boy on his chin. That's why chin is called Hanu, and that's why he's called Hanuman later. So that chin, and the moment that hit the chin, so his mouth got opened and the sun came out. So there was sun in the you know there was a, there was no power like in the Americas there is no power can we feel right? <laughs> but in the India there are certain places where we feel the power. So India was also like this. How can this happen? You know, I stay in the first world, mm-hmm. and this is not possible. But then and then soon after they realized that oh no, uh, they <coughs> don't care. So all the demigods got confused. They said first there was no power, first there was no light, and then now there is no air. What's happening today? And then they realized that by you, he did a strike. You know, he went on a strike. He said, oh, I'm going on a strike. They said, because you made his son unconscious. So he's on a strike. So sometimes what happens is when we work outside as well, our personal problems come in the way of our professional problems, our professional life. So that happened. So it was his personal problem that his son got unconscious, but that came into his life of professional, which is, you know, to provide air to the world. So he said, I am on a strike. There's going to be no air in the universe. Because you made my son unconscious, what was his problem? What was his, you know, there was no, uh, what was the reason? So uh, then Brahma said that actually uh, Hanuman will one day be assisting Lord Ram. He's the eternal servitor of Lord Ram. So this is not what you should have done. So initially, you know, the demigods, whenever they have problems, they go to Brahma. So they went to, they did not go to Brahma, but they released the weapon for Hanuman. But then this Vayu stuff happened, then they all went to Brahma. They said, oh Brahma. You know, this is what happened today. It's a unique day for us today. You tell us what to do. So they said, no, go, apologize. And then all the demigods, they gave their boons to Hanuman. The Agni Dev said that, look, you know, you will never be impacted by a boon. So Brahma said that, you know, you will be interested, you will be as famous as I am. Or you, and Brahma said, you will live for as long as I am in the whole universe. And different kinds of boons were given to Hanuman. Brahma at that time also gave him a necklace, a diamond necklace, and said, nobody in the world will be able to see that necklace other than your master. When he sees it, you would know who's your master. So that's why, you know, usually that was there. So that is one way that he went ahead and, uh, you know, he swallowed the sun. And later also, once Hanuman went to the sun, and then one son saw that, oh my God, he's coming to me. He must be again coming to eat me. Now what? But then Hanuman had become a little more, you know, knowledgeable and realized. So he said that, look, I'm gonna, I wanna take, you are the source of knowledge. You are the source of the universe. You, you know, you like everyone and you have so much knowledge, so I want some wisdom from you. He said, sorry, the class has got, you know, closed. No more admissions. Bhakti Academy, no more enrollments. <laughs> By next semester. He said, no, 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 I want to learn this semester. I want to learn this semester only. He said, look, I, I keep rotating around and I keep moving around everywhere. And I, this is my breath and these were the number of students that I could accommodate. And I've already accommodated them and there is no space. He said, no problem. I will fly with you. So forward or backward, he kept flying with the sun all the time, and he grabbed all the lessons he completed his entire semester. So that was the first flying school in one way for him. And later, when Hanuman, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lakshman, Lakshman was uh, on kind of deathbed. You know the battlefield of, uh, you know, when the war between the Ram and the Ravana. What happened to Lakshman? He got struck by arrow. Uh, yeah. So what was the solution? Sanjeevni. So yeah, so he had to get some herbs, Sanjeevni booty and all. And who bought the Sanjeevni booty? Hanuman. Ah. And how did he get the Sanjeevni booty? He, he flew. got the entire mountain. He also. flew. Yeah, so he flew. He flew all the way. So when, so this was, so of course at that point of time when the arrow stuck uh, Lakshman, it was a time bound, uh, you know, arrow, which said that as there will be, so it was midnight time or something, and then as the sun rises, the impact of that arrow will be really intense and Lakshmana will lose his life. So Hanuman, he was told, look, there is a solution to it. That is, if you bring the herb, and you have to go all the way there and bring the herb. And Hanuman being Hanuman, he saw that way and he said, even if I fly to the north and come back at the lightning speed, I won't be able to, you know, make it before the sun rises. So then what he did, he intelligently, other than flying north, uh, this horizontally, he flew not what you know on a yeah vertical way, and then he went all the way to sun, and sun again went in trauma. Mm-hmm. He said, every time he comes, there is some issue. <laughs> he first swallowed me, now he's coming, now what will you do? So he said, uh, why are you rising? Just go away. You should not be here. And then sun said, I cannot do that. Look at Ravana, he's looking at me. You know, he was so powerful. Ravana was so powerful. Even he looked at 
Sunil, he said, you have to be there. He said, I cannot do it, you know, he's so powerful. He said, I want to participate in the activities of Lord Ram, but I am bound as well. You tell me, what can I do? So he said, this is midnight, you're still up there. He said, yes, that's on the instruction of Ram, and I'll be out uh, soon, because it's going to be, you know, sunrise. So, and then he said, okay. He did not, he wanted to respect Sun God. So what he did, he took Sun God under his underarm, and he flew all the way to the north. So it was like a glowing bulb under his arm, and he flew all the way to the north. He got the hello, and then he came back, and then he, you know, put the sun at his place. So in one way, you know, the time didn't impact, so he was able to do that. So, I mean, the, the overall story of Hanuman is that how he used all his skills for the service of Ram, for the service of Krishna. He had so much anger, he used it for the service of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, to burn the Lanka. So that's really important, I think, for us. Like we read in these written shlokas in Bhagavad Gita as well, that only when we take the shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we'll be able to do something on an anger or on any of our qualities of lust or something. That can only be worked out if we take the shelter of Krishna. And what's the best way of taking shelter of Krishna? Surrender. We know that, Surrender. And we know a lot of ways to take shelter of Krishna. How would you take shelter of Krishna? You would go to Gopinath and you would say, you know, you'd be on his lotus feet and say, I've taken your shelter. All the scriptures say that you should take the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. So I've taken your shelter and all my lust will go away. Will that happen? No. Firstly, Brahmapu is not going to allow you, is it? <laughs> or no, I mean, until we are Brahman Diksha, then we are allowed to do the puja. So that's not going to happen. But even if that happens, you think that's a solution for... Uh, so when they say you should contemplate or when they say you should take the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, what do they mean? How do you take the shelter? Accept in as yeah. Krishna's will. Mm -hmm. okay. Follow instructions of Krishna. Says. Follow instructions of Krishna. Krishna says, okay, so Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, and whose other instructions do we follow? Prabhupada. Prabhupada's instructions. Mm -hmm. We follow the instruction of the uh, uh, spiritual, spiritual master of Prabhupada. Yes, Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. We take the shelter. How do we take shelter of Krishna? We take the shelter of Krishna by the way of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. So Shastra we know. The, the biggest irony is that we understand what is Shastra. We understand it and we have some faith. That's what we are all here, right? We have some faith in the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. When we read it, we have faith. We have some, a little faith in the spiritual master as well. Guru also we have faith. Prabhupada also, oh yeah. How is it possible for any damn man to, you know, create 600 temples you know, roam around across the globe, circle the globe 14 times at the age of 70 and something, he must be someone special. And his disciples also are doing so much indefatigably, must be someone special. But we don't have faith in the sadhus. And who's the sadhu? Or we have faith in the sadhus, but the sadhu living in the next room, not in the sadhu living in the right next to me in my same room. That person is never the sadhu. Do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the sadhu. That's why we, uh, is, it, is it something, most of the time people say, Prabhu, all the anger management stuff and all, I can, I'm such a sadhu person, I'm such a sober person, but not in front of my roommate. <laughs> if you're saying in the ashram, the, the roommate creates the most problem for us. Is that so? Or we think so. That might not be, we think everyone else is a sadhu, but not the person lying next to me. I've seen this person sitting, looking at the woman. He's on the path to be a sadhu, but to be a sadhu, <laughs> so the sadhus are no different people. The sadhus are people living next to you. It's how you know we create a vision of that. How we respect them. So that's also important. We see uh, everyone as sadhu. When when people get married, the husband and wife, you can never see your wife or you can never see your husband as a sadhu. The whole world will say, "Wow, what a beautiful devotee! What a nice devotee!" But you cannot ignore. Same happens with the roommate. Same happens with the best friend. But that's most important at the moment. <laughs> okay, I think too many things to go on. Uh, there are other stories on uh, the demon and the anger as well. I took you say once. There was one, once Krishna, Balram, and uh, Satyaki. He was a charioteer for, uh, you know, so all three of them, they went on a night out, a boy's night out, and they were by the sea, by the ocean. And then they decided, they said, let's guard, you know, one by one. So from 12 to 2, Satyaki, you guard it. From 2 to 4, it's Balram, it's your turn to guard it. And from 4 to 6, Krishna, I'll guard it. So when Satyaki was guarding it, a big demon came out of the ocean. And he started laughing. 
And then, and then Sadia felt, how dare you disturb the sleep of Krishna and Balram? And how are you here? You are not supposed to do it. And he got angry, but he was not able to defeat him. He fought for all the two hours, but he was not able to defeat him. And then he told Balram, he said, Balram, your turn. Yeah, try and defeat him. And then Balram got up, and then Balram tried and defeat him. Balram said, you don't know who am I? And you know, like you are trying to defeat me? And then Balram got even more angry, and he kept defeating, but then it was not possible. He was also not able to defeat him. Then it was Krishna's turn. And then Krishna kept laughing when that demon attacked. So Krishna was laughing all the time. He said, you know what? He said, I, I'm going to eat you. And Krishna was laughing at the best of his abilities. <laughs> and he kept laughing. And then the moment, the moment he was laughing, the demon was becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And he laughed so much every time he had that tantrum to throw. You, you, such a boy, you think you will, you will fight with me? Look at my two friends, you know, Sityaki, Varna, what did they do? And Krishna just kept laughing. And then when the demon became small, smaller, smaller, and as small, Krishna tied it to his dhoti. And then later, you know, they said, what happened to the demon? And Balram and Sityaki asked him, and he said, oh, that demon. <laughs> so, and they said, how did he become such a small figure? He was such a massive person. And Balram said, when I was trying to kill him, he assumed larger form. I became larger, he became even larger than me. Every time he was doing it. So Krishna said, this is just like an anger. The more you feed it, the more angry you become. So this was fun again on something on that. Okay, very Krishna. We can go for some. Have you guys go? Is it too late? Yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah, we can have a little shot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.